Good morning, or good afternoon, or good evening, depending on when you choose to watch this video. I'm Chris Weber, the pastor at St. Peter's Lutheran Church here in St. Paul, Minnesota, and I pray that this video finds you well wherever you are today. We're going to continue our Advent series on these Sundays of looking at the Psalms. Today it's going to be Psalm 126. Before we get to that, if you haven't already done so, please find a seat. Take a seat. If you're doing something, stop whatever it is you're doing. And let's take a moment to take a nice deep breath and remember again who we are because of the grace of God in Jesus Christ. We are those who have been baptized in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. As those baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and Spirit, we confess our belief in this triune God through the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. A reading from Psalm 126. When the Lord restored the fortunes of Zion, we were like those who dream. Then our mouth was filled with laughter and our tongue with shouts of joy. Then they said among the nations, the Lord has done great things for them. The Lord has done great things for us. We are glad. Restore our fortunes, O Lord, like streams in the Negeb. Those who sow in tears shall reap with shouts of joy. He who goes out weeping, bearing the seed for sowing, shall come home with shouts of joy, bringing his sheaves with him. Here ends the reading. To all of you children out there listening today, the Holy Spirit is God's way of working in the world still today as we await Jesus' return. And something that's wonderful about the Holy Spirit is that God is with you by his Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit dwells in you as his children. It dwells in me, it dwells in all of his people here and in every single part of the world where his people are. And what I find amazing about that is it's all the same Holy Spirit. 
The same Holy Spirit that's in you is in me, is in people that are his people in Russia or in Sudan or in Argentina. It's the same Holy Spirit, and we are all connected together then as this great big new family to love and care for each other and to walk in Christ together. I find that so wonderful because it means that in times when I feel alone, times when I may feel disconnected from other people, God reminds us that the Holy Spirit lives in us and the Holy Spirit keeps us connected to Jesus so that we're not alone, that he is with us. And it also keeps us connected with his people around the world. And again, there are times when we are alone and times maybe that we even want to be alone. And that's fine. But in moments of loneliness, in moments where we feel like we're not really connected or cared for by other people, God keeps promise, promising us that the Holy Spirit lives in you, bringing us the love and care of Jesus himself, and also is connecting us together with the rest of God's people as one great big family that he's joined us together to be. The Holy Spirit connects us together. Now, for the rest of you out there listening today, Edward Hopper was an American painter in the early 1900s and into the 1960s. And one of his somewhat famous pieces is entitled Automat. Now, some of you may know what an automat is. I had no idea what it was, so I had to look it up. An automat was an invention of a new type of cafe uh, that began around the turn of the 20th century. You would go into the cafe and instead of having a place where all the, uh, you would see the cooks and the waitstaff and the like, was a wall with a bunch of little doors and compartments on it and you would put money in and open the door and take out your food. Sort of like a, a large vending machine, if you will, if you want to think about it that way. You didn't have to interact with any waitstaff. You didn't see any cooks or chefs. It was just the wall of food. You put money in and you would open the door to get food out and go and sit down. This was all based, I believe, on the idea of, again, speed and convenience and making things smoother and easier. You don't have to interact with as many people. You can just get your food and sit down and eat. Now, Edward Hopper's painting entitled Automat doesn't actually depict that vending machine, so to speak. Instead, what it depicts is a woman sitting in the cafe at a table alone. There's nobody else in the painting. She's holding a mug and a saucer with this sort of blank stare across the end of the table where no one else is sitting. Outside, because there's this huge window framing her behind her, outside it is pitch black dark. And you don't know, I mean, I have no idea if it's nighttime or if it's early morning before the sun comes up, but there is darkness around her. And as you look at that painting, you see she is alone. And you can feel the darkness of that loneliness. Loneliness and isolation are probably a bit all too familiar for many of us today, given our circumstances. Our normal way of social fabric of interacting with people has been incredibly disrupted, right? Masks on faces, physical distance. A lot of the times we see each other through a YouTube video or a Zoom call. Grandparents and grandkids are often separated in ways that don't feel good to either of them. Playdates are postponed definitely for some or moved more outdoors rather than indoors. So many different things have changed for so many people in the way that we engage community and interact with people. And I am convinced that it is not good for us, right? Even though we are making these choices to care and love for our communities given the pandemic, these things are affecting us in ways that we may not even be able to begin to understand. But this loneliness and this isolation that's been going on since March for many isn't something new either. Over the last century or more, there has been a huge push in our culture for speed, for convenience, to streamline things as much as possible. Now, please hear me out on this. I'm not saying that technological advances are inherently bad. Not at all. 
right? Automats, fast food, restaurants, internet, cell phones, social media, these are not inherently bad. They can be beneficial in the way that we function as community, but they also seem to have some implications for us. And there's bodies of research that have been growing around some aspects of these things and how it is creating this huge wake of depression and loneliness and isolation for so many people over the last number of decades. And yet, again, these technological advances aren't inherently bad. In fact, today, they're a huge joy for many people that they can actually engage people face to face, even if it's through a screen and it is good and wonderful, even though it's not necessarily what we want. I bring all of this up today to kind of point out that the loneliness and isolation that is experienced today is not something new. It has been growing for a long time. But it has been incredibly tensified as of March and may continue to become darker for many people in the weeks and months ahead. And in the darkness of that space of loneliness, trying to figure out how in the world do we move into a space of community together can seem impossible because of how shaped we have been in these ways over the last decades and how it is being intensified with our present circumstances today. The psalmist invites us today through his words to remember Yahweh as the one who is able to bring about sudden and total transformation. The psalmist depicts this scene in which there's a number of things going on. There's seeds being put into the ground, seeds buried into the ground. There are people departing from homes and there is weeping that is going on. And we're not really sure what the scene exactly is. Could involve a drought as there's this plea for God to restore like waters flowing in the desert. Could be people dying and grieving the loss as loved ones are buried in the ground. It could be exile that people are departing from their homes by force, being forced to go live under a foreign entity. Whatever the scene is, or if it's something more or else, regardless, the psalmist imagines God as the one who steps into that space and brings about sudden, total transformation. Those that departed are coming home. The seeds that were put into the ground are springing forth with new life. Weeping is turning to joy because God is the one who can bring about that sort of restoration. The psalmist invites us to remember this God, the one who can bring about total and sudden transformation, and to remember that he has acted this way in the past. I was in, uh, reading a, a commentary this week on Psalm 126, and the writer of that commentary describes God as, quote, the one who lives in the gap between death and life. The one who lives in the gap between death and life, end quote. God is the one who chooses to dwell between exile and homecoming, between weeping and joy, and as the one who lives in that space between those things, he sh has shown that he has the power to be able to move people from death to life, from weeping to joy. This is not some sort of just blind assertion of the psalmist. This is ingrained into the communal memories of the people of God. They have memories of God in the past acting in such sudden restoration that it's almost too good to be true. It's like a dream to them. It's like those moments that you see in shows or movies or maybe you just have one in your real life where you look to the person next to you because something so good is happening and you say, Pinch me. You wake me up. This can't be this good. And there's that shock of how good the moment truly is. That's how this psalmist begins. It begins this psalm by remembering one of those almost too good to be true restorative moments. And the people of God have communal memories of God bringing his restoration. Walking out of Egypt free from slavery water pouring down from the sky after an incredibly long drought. People going home after 70 years of being captives in Babylon. God is the one who stands in the gap between death 
and life. He is the one who inhabits that space with his powerful ability to transform and move people into a place of joy. And the people of God remember God doing this in the past. And because he has acted in the past, they call upon him to do it again in the present. Restore us, Lord, right? Bring about this sudden and powerful transformation today. The reality that the Son of God has taken on flesh and dwelt amongst us is a central communal memory for the people of God, for us today. And it is a memory not only of God's ability to bring transformation, it is a memory of the moment in which he brings about that sudden transformation of death to life in the death and resurrection of Christ himself. Jesus has stood in the place of weeping and in the place of joy. He has experienced both being in exile, living underneath a foreign power, and also the joy of homecoming, of taking his place as the king in the midst of God's kingdom. He has gone through the experience of death itself and the experience of resurrection life as well. He stands in the gap. He lives in the gap between death and life between exile and homecoming, in order to move people with his powerful transformation into those spaces of joy. We have the memory of God's people, of Jesus doing this for us and for the world. But Jesus standing in that gap, living in the gap between death and life, is not only about those specific terms of death and exile, this is God living in the gap between the brokenness of this world and all that it is intended and going to be at his return. Jesus chooses to live in the gap between isolation and loneliness and community and meaningful relationships. And he can, he has shown that he has the ability to move people from the darkness of loneliness into the joy of of his community. In Chile, the country of Chile in 1973, there was a coup d'etat and a man by the name of Pinochet became the dictator of the country. And without getting into too many details, under his rule were awful abuses of human rights, torture, violence, disappearances. And the church in Chile, in some respects, tried to respond to this community-destroying power that was at work. They tried to stand in the gap between loneliness and community by moving people into those spaces through things like soup kitchens and areas that were devastated or by fostering community for people to be able to be honest and share about the atrocities that were going on. These are wonderful things, but I don't want to actually focus on those so much today. When I want to focus on uh, is a, a bit of work that a man named William Cavanaugh did, who is an author of a book called Torture and Eucharist. And he studied some of the time and talks about the time that happened in Chile and the church's response. And he talks about the, the sad, belated reality, but yet good reality that the church came to grow in its realization of the community creating power of the Eucharist, that is the Lord's Supper. And he comes to realize, and he writes this in his book, uh, Kavanaugh writes, to participate in the Eucharist, that is the Lord's Supper, is to live inside God's imagination. It is to be caught into what is really real, the body of Christ. That's what I want to focus on for a moment today, the community creating power of Christ, especially present in the Lord's Supper. The Lord's Supper is an ongoing active memory, right? An ongoing engagement of memory, which is what imagination is. An ongoing active memory of the people of God because it is an ongoing activity of faithful Jesus himself. We do experience loneliness today. We experience isolation and at times the darkness that that brings. And if you have not, I would imagine that at some point in your life you have or at least experienced some sort of strain or break in a relationship with someone. That is a fracture in community. 
But though we have experienced those things, Christ continues to be the one who stands in the gap between isolation and community. And as the one who chooses to enter into the gap, he comes to us through his meal in order to join us to himself in meaningful relationship based on his love and his fidelity. And as he joins us to himself and manifests us in himself in that meal, we are also being manifested as this new community that is defined by him and in him. Jesus continues to be the one who can bring about transformation of this movement from loneliness and isolation to community and meaningful relationship because he lives in that space between isolation and community. He is the one who has shown himself faithful in the past to have the power to bring about this sort of transformation. And every single time that we share in the Lord's Supper together, we are sharing in the one, again, who stands in that gap with his transformative power. Whenever we share in that meal, even if it's in a way that's maybe not so common for us, and it's through a household sign-up sheet, and you come and you receive communion, and it's not with some obvious sense of community around you, the promise of Christ remains that we are bound together with him in a relationship, and that in that moment, we are something more. We are something incredible, something so much bigger. We together, even though we are not together, are the body of Christ. We are a new community that is bound up together in the same Holy Spirit, right? Christ is the one who lives in that gap between isolation and community in order to use his transformative power to move us into that new reality of a community in him. This does not mean that we will never experience loneliness. In fact, the loneliness and isolation that some of us may be experiencing may intensify in the weeks ahead, and it can be incredibly hard. But in the midst of that reality for us, Christ keeps holding before us a new reality, one that he invites us to remember one that he invites us to imagine as real today. He keeps reminding us that we are his body, and we are invited to imagine that that is really real today, that we truly are a body with each other, that we are truly a new community together. Again, this isn't going to just erase loneliness and isolation today, but it shapes us to live differently as we learn to trust in this reality that we are a body, that he keeps manifesting his body amongst us and that we are a community in the spirit, it moves us to live according to that reality, to live as a body, to live as a loving and caring community together, and to live and trust that God is the one who lives in the gap, who continues to live in that gap between isolation and community who lives in the gap between death and life, who keeps coming to us to move us by his faithfulness and love towards that place of joy, which will come to its completion when Christ returns. Now may the peace that passes all understanding guard our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that in the midst of the reality of this world, of the loneliness and isolation that abounds, that you hold before us a new reality, a reality of restoration, that you invite us to remember Christ dying and rising from the dead, that you invite us to remember this sudden and incredible transformation that he has brought about in this world, and that that transformation will be sudden and total and complete at his return. Teach us to trust all the more, Lord, that Jesus stands in the gap between death and life, that he holds the power, and he, by his faithfulness, will complete it to bring about restoration in this world. And as we remember, lead us to call out to you, to manifest that restoration even now today. Lord, in your mercy. 
As you remind us of Christ's work in the past and of the Spirit's work now in the present, continue to hold before us the reality that we are a new community. Whether we see it, whether we feel it, whether we get to experience it in the way we want to or not today, remind us over and over and over again that we are a body. When we are feeling lonely, when we are experiencing isolation or breaks in relationships, continue to hold before us the promise that we are part of something bigger. That that loneliness and isolation matters, but we are part of a body. Help us to move towards each other in the spirit and love and care to meet these times of loneliness and isolation. And grant us strength if we are in places that we are experiencing that darkness to speak up so that others can hear us and we pray move towards us if we are experiencing that as well. Lord, in your mercy. Outside of your people, also there is a great deal of loneliness and isolation in this world. In our neighborhoods, in our workplaces, in the grocery stores, in the places that we go, and um, in, in, in electronic spaces as well, on social media and the like. Help us to be those that trust in the Spirit. And learn to move into that gap between isolation and community. To reach out in love and care to help foster relationships and that others would do the same towards us. That more and more may experience the community of Christ and turn and believe in joy. Lord, in your mercy. Trusting in your promises, we are bold to pray as you've taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Again, I pray that this video finds you well wherever you are today. And that the Lord would bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you his peace. For we are his body, his community, joined together in the spirit. This coming Wednesday, uh, we have another midweek Advent service. Uh, if you can, please feel free to join us at 6.30 p.m. on Zoom as we continue our theme of following Jesus if you'd like to be connected with that, feel free to reach out to me at the church office and uh, I will get you connected to that Zoom meeting as well. Until we have the opportunity to see each other again, continue to make good and wise decisions about the places you go, the people you see, the relationships you engage in and how you engage in them. We are again the body of Christ. We are his hands, his feet, his mouth in this world in the way that we live and move together. So let's continue to walk in the spirit and walk in the way of the body of Christ. Continue to stay connected together. We need each other through these days and in the days ahead always as his people. And until we have the opportunity and joy to see each other again, I pray you have a blessed week.